Hi, everyone, and welcome to uh, UOA On Demand. My name is Justin Fleming, and I'm a foot and ankle surgeon at University Orthopedic Associates. And I'm joined uh, today by my colleague, Dr. Kevin Schaefer, who's a foot and ankle expert, also at UOA. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about one of the common problems that we see in foot and ankle, which is perineal tendonitis. And Kevin, I have to say the beard is looking great tonight. Um, I think all of the foot and ankle colleagues at UOA are, are bearded now. So this is this is a good thing. But, uh, you know, a lot of our patients come in to clinic and they've had uh, potentially an injury or some pain on the outside of the ankle for some period of time. And certainly the perineal tendons are, are a source of pain. And so that's really what we're going to spend the next couple of minutes um, talking about. So I think the first thing to talk about is, so where are the perineal tendons and then um, how do they fit into the complex um, anatomy of the of the outside ankle? So Kevin, if you can just tell me kind of what you see and maybe just walk us through the the, the outside of the foot, things that, you know, that we should know when we're starting to have some pain there. Sure. So you can see the perineal tendons and traditionally there are two of them. Sometimes there are small little accessory uh, tendons, but um, not usually the focus, uh, but they run right behind the back of the fibula or the skinny bone on the outside of the ankle. Um, and then they take a, a like a 45 degree turn and head towards the foot. One of those tendons will dive underneath the foot and actually go towards the base of the big toe. Um, but one will attach right at the base of the fifth toe. I can't move the cursor on your screen, um, but that's called the perineus brevis. And together what these uh, tendons do is they control the ability of the foot to invert and evert. And that's really important for walking on uneven surfaces on level ground. Um, it's, it's important to have, um, it's almost a shock absorber as, as you're accommodating those surfaces. And a lot of times we'll see patients in the office when they've taken a trip, they've walked on sand, they've walked on cobblestone streets and the perineal tendons are giving them a little bit of grief, but it's usually pain right along the backside of the fibula. And then right as it makes that 45 degree turn as it starts to come underneath coursing towards the foot. Right. That's uh, that is spot on. And and some of the things that I think that make the foot and ankle complex is just really the high density of structures that exist in a really small area. And so, you know, when we have a, a sprained ankle, we injure this ligament that you see here, which is really just one or two finger breaths away from the tendons. And then right. there's ligaments that stabilize the joints above and below. And so that's really why anatomy is critical in terms of our uh, understanding and how we diagnose patients. So Kevin, as we dive a little bit deeper, uh, specifically to the anatomy of the tendons, can you just describe um, kind of what the uniqueness is? Um, you describe what their function is, but what, what makes these tendons a little bit unique in their anatomy and, and why they're important to us? Sure. Um, so they, they run in a groove right behind the fibula. Um, you can see it. Yep, your cursor's pointing it there. And it's important uh, that as those tendons glide up and down behind the fibula, that they're stable back there. And there, there are some injury patterns where actually that little what's called cartilaginous ridge um, can come off of the bone or that overlying retinaculum that keeps the tendons uh, behind the fibula becomes injured. And in those cases, uh, the tendons can come out from the side and out and around the fibula and, and rub up on the fibula and become irritated. What we also see is because they're they're hugging the backside of the bone, commonly in an ankle sprain, uh, the perineus brevis or the larger tendon there that's in your cross section, which is closer to the fibula, uh, can get compressed into the fibula. And that's one of the theories as to why some patients get a longitudinal split tear or just a fraying of that tendon, which many times isn't a surgical problem, but could explain uh, why we see that injury there on an MRI and can explain why someone might have pain there. And as the, the tendons go down, you can see in your image on the, the left, as they make that 45 degree turn, there are a number of stabilizing structures that keep them um, within a certain orientation relative to the foot. And those are also important in terms of the stability of the tendons, but they can also be further sources of compression, particularly if you have swelling in the tendons. You can imagine them trying to glide under those grooves. And if there's a bony prominence or swelling, um, that normal gliding motion can be impeded. Right. And, and so sometimes um, I'll explain it uh, that there are two tendons and the tendons represent a cable, right? And so the, the muscle is the motor, the tendons are the cables, and these cables sit in a pulley system behind the ankle. And there's a variety of things, as Kevin mentioned, that could get injured. 
One is the ligament that holds the cables inside the pulley. Sometimes there's an abnormality with the pulley or the bone. Um, and then lastly, um, if there's abnormal motion of the cables or the tendons, you can get fraying and that creates problems like longitudinal tears that, that he just mentioned. So when you see patients in clinic and you've been doing this for a while, what are, what are some of the common scenarios that patients may uh, injure their perineal tendons? I think we touched on one of the scenarios before where someone will have a, an ankle sprain, right? They invert their ankle and the perineal tendons will be aggravated because they had to fire as the, as the ankle twists. They had to fire to stabilize the ankle and bring it back towards a neutral position. So that's one setting, more of an acute injury. And those are also the settings where you can have injuries to some of those supporting structures. Um, I think your image on the left is a, is a really important point. And I always have patients stand in the office and I look at their alignment because sometimes these aren't uh, acute injuries. Um, patients are just going about their life and they notice soreness without any sort of event that they can you know, point their finger on um, as, as the match that lit the fire, so to speak. And what you have there is you can look at that patient's heel alignment and you can see the heels are tilted in a little bit. We call that hind foot varus. And you can imagine those pulleys on the outside of the ankle um, getting stretched a little harder, having to work a little harder to stabilize the ankle just from the normal standing alignment of that heel bone. So sometimes these are overuse injuries due to structural uh, changes or, or abnormalities rather than acute injuries. Uh, other scenarios, which I mentioned before, are overuse injuries without a, a, a glaringly obvious structural abnormality, like someone has gone to Europe and they're walking on the cobblestone streets of France for weeks, and that's not something they usually do, and their perineal tendons are working a lot harder um, than normal. Yeah, and so one one way to think about it is people that have high arch foot or the hind foot varus, uh, as was mentioned, they tend to wear out the tendons on the outside of the ankle. And then patients who have flat feet, which we probably see much more common, they tend to wear out the tendons on the inside of the ankle. So um, flat footedness is more common than high arch, but, but certainly in the context of perineal tendonitis, this is something we see relatively commonly. So Kevin, tell me what types of things would you expect to see when you examine a patient in the office um, in, in terms of your hands-on and then what you might see on an x-ray and you know, would you need to order anything else? Yep. So what I start with is inspection, and that's with the patient standing. As we mentioned before, I look for any structural abnormalities or or slight variances in anatomy that might lead those tendons to getting overworked. And then I look along the course of those tendons. If someone has a really angry tendonitis, they usually have swelling along that perineal sheath. You, you know, if you look at your ankle, you should be able to see the contour of that outside ankle bone, the fibula. Um, and feel the tendons behind it. And if someone has a really bad tendonitis, sometimes you can't really see the definition of the bone. You just kind of, kind of see swelling on the outside of the ankle. Um, I then palpate. And as you mentioned, anatomy is key in foot and ankle, a couple of millimeters one way in, in a direction, and you're pushing on a completely different structure. So I kind of hug the back of the bone with my fingers, and I, I see where the tendons are, are the most painful. It's usually not along their entire course. There's usually one spot that's more tender than another spot. And that can also give you clues as to, as to how you can treat it or why they might have injured it. Um, I then assess the pain with motion, both active and passive motion, which can give you more information as, as to how aggravated the tendons are and how healthy they are. And someone, for example, who has a high arch foot with a varus heel, if those tendons have been overworked for a long time and they're not gliding normally, not very functional, they might not have the same arc or ability to move the foot and ankle as you might expect as someone with healthier tendons that are going to glide the normal range of motion. Um, I then assess the power. So again, you should be able to resist e pushing your foot out either with good power. And if that's painful, that's also another clue that those tendons aren't happy at the moment. So sometimes patients will come in and they'll complain of either a popping or a clicking, snapping. Can you can you share what what is that? What is it that they're experiencing? Sure. So uh, that can be a number of different things. Sometimes patients will have a painless popping or clicking. That's usually not one we worry much about. Sometimes the tendons can kind of trigger or flick past each other behind the ankle like that without dislocating around the groove. So that can be one cause. A lot of times that's not, that's not so painful for patients, but every once in a while it can be painful. Um, they can dislocate, as you mentioned. They can come out from around that groove and come on the side of the fibula. And you can have the, we'll have the patient move their ankle in a circle or, re, or resist pushing out to the side. And a lot of times you can see that tendon come around the border of the fibula uh, visually with your eyes. 
And so after your you know, clinical examination, uh, obviously you take an x-ray, would you expect to see much on an x-ray or what would you expect to see on an x-ray with patients who have perineal tendonitis? Well, if, if someone has more of a chronic overuse issue related to a structural abnormality, you can get a lot of clues from the x-ray, right? You can see the hierarchy. You can see the heel bone tilted in. Um, you're not seeing a fracture, right? This isn't a fracture of a broken bone. You can see another uh, family of diseases, sometimes called POPs, which is a little bit above um, uh, the level of detail we need to get into, but there are accessory bones that can live inside the perineal tendons, which sometimes are, are problematic. Some people can have a prominent tubercle or a prominent uh, projection from the bone uh, where the tendons glide past them. So there are other clues you can see, but you can't usually see the tendons themselves. You're seeing other things that might explain why the tendons are aggravated. Okay. And then when is an MRI indicated uh, for this problem? Sure. I, I think that in, depends entirely on the patient presentation, right? If there's uh, an acute injury and there's concern for perineal instability or something's not clear on exam or you're wondering if there's a surgical issue, then sometimes I'll get an MRI uh, sooner rather than later. But if it's a chronic overuse issue, I'll try many other things. Okay, so you've you've established that someone has uh, perineal tendonitis. What what are the next steps? How are you going to treat them? What are the options? Sure. Uh, so in most cases, we can start with non-operative measures and and with basic things, not advanced imaging right up front. Although there are some scenarios where you're you're considering a surgical stabilization procedure, or there's someone with a high level injury where you think there might be a surgical problem. You're worried about the tendons even being attached, those sorts of things, we can get advanced imaging up front. But a lot of times um, we can brace the patient, whether it's a boot or a lace-up brace or some sort of device to give the tendons a little bit of a rest. We can put different lifts in the shoe. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll put a lift in the shoe that is a little bit wider on the outside of the shoe, just to evert the heel a little bit, just to rest the tendons. Um, and it's based upon how tender they are. If someone is really tender, I'll put them in a boot or a brace. If someone is just a little tender, I'll put, I'll put them, um, I'll put the lift in their shoe. And then my personal formula is I don't send them the physical therapy until the tenderness um, has gotten better. I, I worry sometimes that if you send patients to physical therapy when they have a really inflamed um, tendonitis, that sometimes they get a little bit worse. So I brace them to calm them down. And when that tenderness goes away, I, I then think they're uh, receptive to physical therapy. If those things don't work, if you've gone through a, a course of bracing and therapy, then it's time to take a look with advanced imaging and, and better understand where the pathology is and what you might have to do about it. So let's just say that you've gone through all of the necessary, you know, um, conservative treatments. You've tried braces and anti-inflammatories and physical therapy and rest, and it's not just not better. Um, you know, the question is, when is surgery indicated? And I'm going to show you something that we commonly see, and you alluded to it early, which is really the mechanical instability. And maybe you can just describe what it is that you see um, in this video. And I'll just turn the volume down here. So maybe you can describe what you see in this video. Sure. So just starting with the anatomy, as you mentioned, uh, which is really important, you can see the contour of the fibula there. And your thumb is, is in the back, right? Your, the heel is on the right side of that image. And you're coming in behind the fibula and you can see the tendons coming around that edge of the fibula if you play it again. So there you're, you're pushing in that groove and you're actually able to push the tendon over the side of the fibula there. So it's clearly unstable. It's not able to, to live where it's supposed to be in its home back behind the fibula. Yeah. And this was a division one football player that had a single injury uh, that kind of disrupted that pulling mechanism. But certainly we see this more in a, in a chronic uh, setting. Okay, and, and this is a common procedure that we do when all else fails for the condition that we just saw. And can you just describe, you know, basically what, what is it that we do to fix the problem that, that exists? Sure. So, and as we showed in that in original anatomy slide, in, in most patients, there's a little bit of a groove, a little bit of a, a space for those tendons to glide in behind the fibula without coming out around the side. Um, so one of the procedures is called a groove deepening, where we, we create a bigger space, or if there isn't one, we create one uh, so that the tendons are encouraged to live behind the fibula and not come out around the side of the fibula. And then again, that covering, that retinaculum, if that has lifted off the fibula, uh, what we can do is sew it back down, either through bone tunnels or anchors, 
to again, um, encourage the tendons to live behind the fibula and prevent them from dislocating out around the side. And so we've spent a little time, probably more time on the operative management, the surgical management, but in my opinion, and I would love to hear yours, the majority of these are end up really not being surgical. Uh, I believe most of these are transit, they come and go, and they just require a little bit of care. Uh, what What is your feelings on that? Yeah, I, you know, this is a, it's a bit of a difficult topic in the sense that this is really a family of diseases with so many different etiologies. And I agree with you in general, most patients will get better with non-operative care, particularly if they have something you can address that's, that's straightforward. So if someone has a structural abnormality of their foot, uh, like a high arch with a heel that's kicked in, a lot of times we can give them an orthotic or change something in their shoe that will offload the tendons. And a lot of those patients will respond. Acute injuries as well, ankle sprains um, with an appropriate course of therapy, a lot of those patients will respond. But, um, you know, as we mentioned, if, if patients are not responding, that's when we get the advanced imaging and we see if there's something else we can do. Right. Dr. Schaefer, thank you for your uh, expert insights on perineal tendonitis. Thank you for joining us tonight. If you know anybody that suffers from this condition or any other orthopedic condition, please um, come see us at the University of Orthopedic Associates. All right. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, Kevin.